all this came to us once we said, hey, let's pick a lane and stay in the lane. So when I say the blocking and tackling of 401k plan at its most basic level, you have to meet with every participant in the plan, every single participant. So if you're an advisor and you want to get a plan with a thousand participants, you need to run 2000 meetings a year. How are you going to do that? Welcome to the Active Advisor Podcast, brought to you by Harbor Capital. Join us as we learn from pros who have helped thousands of investors live better lives. I'm Brian Moore, and I'll be chatting with some of the brightest minds in the financial advisory business, bringing you insights on practice management and investment research that works for advisors and their clients. Joining me today on this episode of the Active Advisor Podcast is Evan Pulowski, a senior partner and 401k plan advisor at Michigan 401k Advisors. During his previous tenure at Paychex, Evan made a significant impact in the retirement planning sector, having assisted hundreds of Metro Detroit companies in enhancing their 401k offerings. In his current role, he provides objective guidance to retirement plan sponsors and trustees by partnering with local firms and 401k providers to deliver comprehensive support. Outside of his professional endeavors, Evan spends his time coaching youth hockey, volunteering with the junior golf program, and spending time with his wife and two children. Welcome, Evan, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, before we dive into the conversation, love to hear a little bit more in your own words about your focus within your current role. Yeah, I, I'm primarily a fiduciary to over 80 401k plans in the Metro Detroit area. We do expand across the country in, in service participants. Um, I spend most of my time working with plan sponsors directly to make sure that their plans are meeting and exceeding the goals of their participants and organizing with my team of advisors to make sure that those participants are getting the one-on-one -on -one point of contact that I think every 401k and future retiree deserves. Um, we're in a growth mode at Michigan 401k Advisors, um, and we're looking to help as many people become millionaires um, as we can day to day. Those are excellent goals. And I'm sure the people in your clients, uh, the people that you're talking to and your clients are very happy and you know, love those goals as well. Who would it? Typically here on the Active Advisor, I like to get the conversation started by asking each of our guests, what is the first memory you have related to money or investing? You know, I, I was thinking about this question prior to the call and I kept coming back to the same thing. So in Michigan, um, if you buy a pop, uh, soda pop is what we call it up here, a can, you get a 10 cent um, uh, deposit on a can. You pay it and then you can return and get 10 cents. I vividly remember from about the age of eight to 12, collecting cans from my house, from my neighbors, um, and, and returning them to the store to get money for whatever I wanted, baseball cards. I couldn't even really tell you what, what I was spending my money on at the time, but I just vividly remember amassing cans and taking them uh, to the store return for the deposit. So that's probably my first money memory. Um, as I grew up, my parents and my and my wants became bigger uh, and more expensive. Uh, my parents were able to say, hey, uh, big purchase, a new pair of rollerblades. If you got half the money, we'll pay the other half. And I would just scour the neighborhood searching for cans and, and probably at that time cutting lawns and washing cars as well. So my first money memory would be scouring for cans and collecting deposits and returning them to the local um, party store. You know, that's that's such a good and, and vivid memory, I think, for for a lot of people. And it's one of those, I think, teaches work ethic and it teaches you really kind of the fundamental value of, OK, I've got to do something in order to get something, which is, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of a kind of a kind of a thing that that it's a great lesson to learn early on in life. Not so great if you've managed to kind of go down the go down the road a couple of years. Love to hear more having that kind of eth work ethos background kind of and, and kind of instilled in you it sounds like at a young age love to hear a little bit more kind of about the background post that that period of time obviously but kind of you know the background kind of you know college and the journey kind of that led you to your ultimately to your current role at michigan 401k advisors sure um so i'm a graduate of uh university of michigan dearborn it's a satellite campus to u of m i played hockey there for uh two seasons and, and um and actually i graduated high school in las vegas um so I was one of the few uh, out-of-state students at a commuter school. But I, I, at that at that time, um, going back to the cans, I always had an entrepreneurial spirit. So I think I'm sort of the last of a generation where my parents said, hey, go to school, get a degree. It proves you're trainable. We don't care what you get your degree in. And I ended up with sociology and a psychology degree. So jokingly, I'm qualified to run a bookstore, basically. But from that, while in school... I started my first business, um, my first real LLC, and, and that was a, a valet company. 
working at, at a golf course every Monday, a valet company would come in to do special events. They'd park the cars, take our tips, and me and a partner were like, this doesn't work for us. So we went to the general manager and said, hey, let us park the cars. To which we were met with, you can't park cars. You're not insured. You're not bonded. You, you, don't, you can't do this. Well, we didn't take no for an answer. And we turned to a member of the club and said, hey, help us out. Figure a, a path through. He hooked us up with someone to get insurance. Before we knew it, we were parking cars on Monday, recovering those tips that we had lost or thought we were losing at that time. Fast forward to the winter. Well, we have this valet company. We don't have a client and we don't really want to work for anybody else because we're still going to school. So we found a restaurant. Uh, the restaurant took us in. We parked cars there. It was probably enough just for us to fill our pockets. I mean, we're college kids and paying for books and things like that. Fast forward a couple of years before we know it, we're the third largest uh, valet company in Metro Detroit. Um, running the the parking for a hospital system. And that's where at the time I didn't know that and know the idea of growing too fast, but I was right in the middle of growing too fast. So the hospital, which would pay us net 30, became net 45, became net 60, became net 90, became, you will pay you when we can. Um, at this point, we've gone from my partner and I being the only two employees to around 90 to 100 employees park, parking cars. Um, and that created a cash crunch for us. So that cash crunch sort of forced us into a position where we had to sell off the company. And uh, it's a 2008, um, not a great time to be trying to restart your career. Um, but I found my way to, to paychecks in a, in a sales role doing um, wholesaling for their TPA services inside the 401k. And really, I learned financial services right from right there. I met my current business partner, Stephen Case, um, who was the founder of, at the time, it was Financial Imbe uh, Independence. We're now Michigan Retirement Advisors. And we came together to create Michigan 401k Advisors. And in a, a, about, what are we, we're 14 years in. In 14 years, we've gone from zero 401k plans to over 100. Um, we've got over 160 million in assets we manage. And we estimate that we have somewhere between 5,000 and uh, 8,000 participants who, who we take uh, responsibility for um, their retirement success and future. Um, so that, that's sort of the nexus of how I got from collecting cans to uh, becoming a 401k fiduciary. Uh, and, and I've got a lot of people to thank along the way. No, that's awesome. It really is one of the, the, the best stories I think I've heard. It, it, it's kind of one of those things, you know, I grew up in the South, so I'm, I'm just going to use a Southern term, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and you kind of learn along the way, you know, and I think that really... It sounds like that hard work and that ethos and possibly maybe some of your sports background kind of helped teach you a few lessons and kind of, you know, help keep the fire going during 08 when th things were tough with the cash crunch. In your initial call, you mentioned that you're really, you're not really doing anything differently. You're just doing the work. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear in your own words what the work actually means and how it's led to success for you and the firm. Absolutely. So financial advisors go to their broker dealer convention, they go to marketing seminars and meetings, and they're always encouraged like, hey, get into the retirement space, run corporate plans, you're going to get the business owner as a potential client, do some high level insurance planning, you know, potentially you'll get rollovers. That is a story. And I'm here to say that that's all true. But the reason it fails is because advisors don't do what I call the blocking and tackling, just the basics to get it done. And they fail because of scale as well. So what, it, what does that mean? Well, when I was with Paychex, we sold a retirement uh, record keeping and TPA service. So advisors would use this chassis and they were responsible for all the participant education meetings, educating the, the plan sponsor, being the fiduciary over the investment. So doing reviews on the investments and doing annual or, or semi-annual benchmarking, all of that fell back onto the advisor. So when you start with an advisor who just wants to grow their wealth management book and steps into the 401k sphere, first off, 401k, we're probably getting paid a quarter or at least a quarter or a third of what you're making when you're on your individual wealth client. So the the cost, the dollar for return of, of time is is way down. Now, you what you have to do is you got to meet with the plan sponsor twice a year. That's our service model. Our service model, we're also meeting with the participants up to four times a year. I wish every client I had let us do quarterly meetings. The reality is we're, we're really working hard with the participant to get out there. And, and two times is probably more than typical. And then we're following up with one-on-one. -on -one. So I said earlier, we've got between 5,000 and 8,000 participants. How the heck do you scale this as an individual advisor? It's almost impossible. So what Steve and I did, because Steve had the same idea. Hey, I want to build out a retirement plan practice, which would be go on to become Michigan 401k advisors. And I think initially he thought, 
I'll bring Evan in. He's got an expertise working at Paychex. He has an understanding. We'll run the meetings. We'll do the work. We'll be the fiduciaries. And then we'll reap the benefits of gaining the business owner as clients and gaining rollovers. It just didn't happen. We got plans. We got assets under management. And it kind of stopped there. And the reason I believe it stopped there is because it's almost disingenuous to, for a financial advisor to say, I'm an expert at the 401k space. I can help your qualified plan, guide it through DOL, ERISA, and investment. I can do all that. And oh, by the way, I'm really good wealth manager too. So what we did is we kind of reorganized our business in 2014 after we had success growing. Um, and, and we said, let's step back. I became the name fiduciary to all of our plans, responsible for the investment committee meetings, responsible for plan sponsor education, and um, group presentation and, and organizing our education policy for each one of our plans. And then we hired in some core, really good, hungry advisors to do the one-on-one -on -one allocation advice, to work with the participants in the one-on-one. -on -one. The second we diversified our practice by the services we were offering, then we started to see the rollovers, the, the rollover business group. The plan sponsors started engaging us, asking us the higher level question. We now do defined benefit plans. We do high level insurance. We do succession planning. All this came to us once we said, hey, let's pick a lane and stay in the lane. So when I say the blocking and tackling of 401k plan at its most basic level, you have to meet with every participant in the plan, every single participant. So if you're an advisor and you want to get a plan with a thousand participants, you need to run 2,000 meetings a year. How are you going to do that? You got to meet with the plan sponsor at least semi-annually. So that's going to be in the investment committee meeting arena. You may have to form that investment committee or help guide the sponsor to doing that, but you got to meet with them twi uh, twice a year. So multiply that by every, every plan you have. We just keep adding more and more meetings, but they're important and critical to the success of the plan and the participants in it. And then lastly, you have to have a communication structure where you're going to be the first line of defense for the plan sponsor. So we have a relationship manager who's in-house. Most providers will give you a relationship manager to the plan, but we, we advocate for our, parts, our plan sponsors to call us. We, if we don't know the answer right away, we'll go wait on hold. We'll figure out the answer and get it back to you. You're too busy running ABC widget company ma making the, the future happen to worry about these questions that are almost administrative and HR related inside your 401k. So we've got a person in-house who handles that. Um, it's the people, it's the scale, and it's doing that necessary work that I call the blocking and tackling. Gotcha. I mean, I think that's really one of the things that that really kind of separates a, a lot of the high-performing advisors and high-performing firms such as yours and, and kind of others, I guess. I think this is one of those businesses. I know we went through that period of time where you know, AI is going to take over. People want to go to, to other different avenues, but this still is a relationship business. And I think, you know, it was great to hear you mention that and kind of how you do meet with everybody one-on-one, -on -one. because I think at the end of the day, you know, we all have to kind of remember these are people's livelihoods and kind of retirements mm -hmm. that we're kind of looking at. That's an awesome lesson. I think one that's probably one of the harder ones to learn. Um, but I, I you know, would love to hear kind of, did you learn anything from your time at Paychecks? or even in sports maybe that you've been able to take with you and apply to the work you do today? You know, uh, hockey, I was a little bit of, uh, of what we would call a, a goon. I would do whatever it took to win. If that meant, you know, putting a stick across your wrist uh, for the good of the team, I was I was happy to do that and then go serve the penalty uh, while my other teammates scored, scored the goals. Um, so hockey doesn't really get directly into the arena of, uh, of my practice, um, but paychecks most definitely does. Um, Paychex is a super sales organization. They taught me um, the discipline it takes. Um, C3 set three. Um, Joe Landis, my my manager uh, at Paychex, uh, was instrumental in the growth of my business. Um, so C3 set three. Um, we had to see three uh, new 401k clients uh, a day, and we had to set three. We couldn't leave the office till we set three appointments. Um, in doing that, that really got me to understand the role of the record keeper. I was in a sales organization doing a sales role. As an advisor, I'm in a relationship role. So at Paychex um, or at a record keeper, I just needed to win once. Win once, move on, get the next sale. As a financial advisor, I, you have to win every single day. You are, you're building a relationship. So, and I, I tell clients that all the time when, when we, we sign on to their, their plan, that it's my job and my team's job to win your business every single day. 
Uh, and that's done through our relationship manager. It's done through our, our ongoing meetings. So I guess what I would say paychecks taught me is they taught me the discipline to build a structure that's successful. That was their sales structure. But it also showed me the gap in the industry on, on who's in it, in it for what and, and where there's a, a, a necessary um, room. Additionally, paychecks, they do have some large plans, but for the most part, they're, they're working with mom and pop organizations. And I really found that that was the underserved community. And that's really our target business to this day is a, um, a business owner who is paternalistic or maternalistic. They're involved. I can meet with them. They care. They probably know the names of their staff. When there's a birthday and a cake in the break room, they're probably showing up to sing happy birthday. So they care. And that's probably the most underserved base in the retirement plan sphere. Everybody wants the big corporate plan, $100 million of assets. You know, everybody's white, white, white collar. But that's not the heartbeat of America. We always talk about small businesses driving America, and I see that every day. And, and small businesses, we like to give them Fortune, five ben Fortune 500 benefits at a small business scale. And, that, and that's what I think we're successful in doing. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Since you are, it seems like you've got your, your, yeah, you know, finger on the kind of the heartbeat uh, of kind of small businesses in middle America. Would love to hear, and you know, in, in your own words, or what you're kind of thinking. What are the the key factors that these companies should consider when selecting a 401k advisor? The thing that everybody races to is, is costs or fees, which I think is the most important question. How much do you make, and how do you get paid when you're buying anything? You're buying a washing machine. How much do you make, and and, and how do you get paid? A roofer comes to your house. How, how much do you make, and how do you get paid? That's important. But really, you're going to want to see two things, an investment policy statement, which says, hey, this is the structure on, on how we're going to pick and select investments for the participants, because all, all, the, all the administrative stuff can, can, can be good or bad. But at the end of the day, the experience is returns, and that's what your participants care about. And then the other thing, it, it, what makes us a little bit unique, and I didn't invent the, invent the wheel, Lake, Lake Mason actually came out of this, is the education policy statement. And what Leg Mason did is they came through a, a checklist on how you should be interacting with your participants throughout the year and what's the responsibility of the plan sponsor and administrative as far as the fiduciary roles are concerned. So we actually go through this checklist with our sponsors. We plot out through the year because, like I said, we want to come out four times a year, but you're like, hey, you know what? You can come out twice a year. We, we plot it out. We give them back a calendar and an education policy statement that really serves for two reasons. Number one, it lets you know what you're getting from your advisor. This is actually what I'm getting. And number two, it creates an accountability checklist. At the end of the year, you said you were going to be out in April. You said you were going to be out in September. You were going to do market updates and new enrollments and meet with everybody. Did you do it or did you not do it? And if you didn't do it, was that because our, our business activities didn't allow for it? Or did you let me down on the on the job? That's what I think that plan sponsors should be looking for from their um, their advisor. Uh, I would also say these are minimum expectations. After that, then you want to look at things like like personality and are they a good fit and, and will they get along with, with, with my team? Because that does matter. It, it 100% matters. I realize that I'm not the advisor for every single plan, but I'm a good fit on, on some of them, and I, I feel like I can help out more than more than I don't fit with. That's awesome. I would love to hear. We're going to shift gears just a little bit. Love to hear. I think we've talked things to look for in a 401k advisor. Uh, love to hear kind of if you have a story or anything that that comes to mind would be great as well. What are some of the challenges you've seen companies face when they haven't put in this work up front and selecting the right 401k or, you know, provider uh, or yeah. advisor? Might need to rebuild kind of the program or switch providers. Yeah. Uh, so the thing that I, I think is most important is Arissa and I believe that they ask they require that you, you benchmark your plan every three years. You take a look at the providers, that the your record keepers, your TPAs, your advisor, uh, and your funds, and say, hey, are these good or bad for my participants? Like, how do they bear during the market? There's been so much margin compression recently and, and, and provider compression where when I started out with paychecks, there were 35 competitors in the market. Now I would say there's probably about eight quality record keepers. Because of that, sponsors have not gone back and looked at their, they haven't done the benchmarking. They haven't looked at their plan. And more importantly, that benchmarking should be a third party entity. You can't let the fox watch the hen house. So what I would encourage plan sponsors to do is make sure you're benchmarking your plan. We benchmark all of our plans annually because the last thing I want to do is have one of my plan sponsors hear about a great idea or something in the marketplace that's available to them, and they didn't get that information for me. 
as the fiduciary to plan, I need to be the leader. I need to be the Sherpa taking you up the mountain and helping your participants get back down the mountain when, when they're ready to retire. And that requires an active, uh, an, an active role. So I mentioned that the, there's been some compression in the providers that are available to plan sponsors. This is an this is an asset or an opportunity to a lot of a lot of plan sponsors because they can get tools at a lower cost than they ever could before. Things that that were like cool ideas in 2012 are table stakes today. And if you haven't made a plan change or if you haven't investigated what's available to you, there's probably levers even with your current provider that you can turn off. So oftentimes I see there's access to things that a plan sponsor has that they're not using. So let's get those turned on. And the other thing is yesterday's providers aren't always today's best providers. Uh, in addition to that, if your plan has grown significantly, it was a startup and now it has 5 million in assets, your, your purchasing power is much stronger. You probably need to reevaluate your cost structure, even with your current provider. And then the lastly, last thing I would say is the investments. I like to say every baby born is perfect. When you started your plan, your investments were great. But if you haven't been following an investment policy statement, or if you haven't been monitoring changing your investments uh, at regular in intervals as the market cha change, um, you probably have some weeds in your garden. You probably have some very good investments, uh, but you probably have some that, that could be replaced. There are investments that are available today that weren't even available four or five years ago um, that are higher quality, lower cost, and probably more suitable and appropriate for your plan today. Awesome. You know, those, those are all good points, I think. Um, have you worked with a company that's had to change providers to you guys or, or kind of anybody else that you've seen some pitfalls or anything to, that that's worth mentioning that the the audience might look like to hear? Yeah, I mean, without naming names of, of providers, I kind of mentioned it uh, before. The providers that I built my business on from 2010 to 2014, a number of them I don't even use or or, or won't even use. What's what's tough for providers right now? Technology costs. So if you had the cat's pants in 2012 and you weren't investing in technology up until now, you have a provider. I'll, I'll use use a provider I like, Empower. Empower has been acquiring other record keepers because their technology cost to adapt to where we are today just is too great. So it's just easy for, easier for them to sell to Empower, bring them on the Empower chassis, which is very good, leading, leading technology uh, right now. They run Apple's 401k uh, plan. Not to say everybody should be with Empower. There are other good providers, but that is a good example of where scale and cost have hurt yester yesterday's great plan. And I think that's true in every every industry it happens all the all the time where you keep doing the same thing over and over again you've been doing a great a great job but somebody came along and and didn't have the turnaround cost to upgrade their technology and now you're you're behind the eight ball uh and in the motor city we see it a lot with auto companies where the cost of retooling and the cost of of changing is too great yeah no that's an excellent point uh love to hear in your words like what do you think the next five to 10 years looks like in the 401k space? I mean, obviously we've seen kind of dramatic upheaval in the past 10 uh, and just listened to you in the conversation and and definitely some things I think for, for myself and for the audience to take away. What do you think are kind of the two to three big things that's going to happen in the next decade? Yeah. So when people describe, describe bubbles in financial services, they think tech bubble or, or, or housing crisis, and, and they just think of the eruption of the bubble. So I'm actually going to going to try and rework that analogy a little bit, because I think it applies to what's going on in our market space right now. So think of a bubble as a sphere, a, 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 not a bursted bubble, but a sphere with a hollow space in, in the middle. And, and here's what I think is happening in, in the marketplace. We're on the front end of that bubble. We're seeing uh, uh, compression of service providers, compression of fees. We're seeing a lot of new tech startups, new ideas. Payroll companies are integrating. A lot's happening on the on the front end, and a lot of it's moving towards buzzword AI. But where things are getting done, um, whether it's our iPhone or things are getting done for us, right? And so I think there's this gravitation to people say, hey, lower cost, let the computer figure it out, let the algorithm take control, let me be passive in this space, and, and that'll be better for me because of the cost compression and things like that. So I think that's the edge of the bow we're moving into. And we're going to have this gap space where people are going to move towards that algorithm. They're going to buy into these technologies. They're going to say, AI can do it for me. But I know, I know in my heart of hearts that People still need that human advice because there's such an emotional component to investing in these decision making. 
So my fear is that plan sponsors move into the bubble. They reduce their cost. Everything gets automated. And a lot of young investors and, and middle, and middle you know, I'm, I'm 42 today, a lot of middle-aged investors get left without the information they, they need in that bubble. And then we'll move back to the other end of the bubble. And it's not going to burst, but we're now going to go back into a high quality provider. So maybe we have this middle area where we are using the algorithms and passive management to in the accumulation phase, which I don't 100% agree with, but there is going to be a necessary point of people, human beings, to get people into the plan on the right track and then to help people decumulate on the other side. And this goes true. This is true for the um, the providers as well. Providers are trying to take more and more on and put it on a computerized algorithm tra- chassis and people will move into the bubble and find that customization has been lost. Every 401k plan will begin to look identical because it has to for it to be effective on that chassis. Of our plans, oh, no two look, look alike. I would love it if they all had the same investments and the same providers, but they just don't because the needs of the business owners are still that unique. So I like to reorganize the idea. I don't see a burst. I think that's our next five to 10 years as we try and figure out when do we need customization in humans and when can AI or the algorithm take care of it? And, and you're going to need both. I think we end up with a barbell, but right, I think that's the bubble we're moving through right now. Perfect. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, I think it's one of those things that um, sure you can use AI for a lot of great things just, you know, at, at the top of the house. But when you, when you start dealing with humans that have different interests and different goals and different everything else, then, you know, no two people are the same and no two families are the same. And I think you're right. I mean, you're going to need that level of kind of customization for each one of those uh, families, which is, you know, yeah. Good to hear. With that said, since we agree on that, would love to hear, obviously, we now know what the next five to 10 years look like, I guess, in your space. We'd love to hear what's next for Michigan 401k advisors. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, we're in growth mode. I I, I see that we can take on about 30 plans um, without having to really rework our, our, our team. Our advisory team, we're unique in that um, Steve Case, my partner, he's going to turn 60 uh, this year. I'm 42. Uh, our next advisor is 33. We have a 28-year-old and a 26-year-old. So we're built for the long run. Our, our, our goal is to keep growing organically um, in in the, in this space. Um, we are leveraging technology on the communication side uh, and, and on the outreach side so that we are getting individuals at a younger or earlier age in their working career um, because we all know starting early and 80 uh, is the way to have a successful retirement and 82% of your success, retirement outcomes is your contribution. So we really want to focus on getting people where they're at now uh, and being around for, for the long haul, long haul. Um, 401k um, will be a core part of our business going, going forward and our wealth management fall, falls behind that. Well, Thank you so much. I know I've, I've peppered you with a lot of questions. I have one final one. I know you've been a great okay. sport. At Harvard, we're firm believers in active management, though it's important to acknowledge that every financial expert has their own unique perspective. From your experience, what is your take on active management and where have you seen it making the most significant difference? This question couldn't be more timely. So yesterday I was on site at a client. Uh, we started working with them in about 2014, and that was the time where everything was compressing. The fiduciary rule was coming out, shelf space was going away and, um, and their things were changing. Everybody was moving to the lowest fee structure. And we went with a passive target date series for this particular client. Well, in a rising tide up until what, 2021, that was a, a great solution. Prior to 2021, we, we changed to, to an active solution. And when I was on site with that client, we used that by 360 as one of our tools. Every single uh, vintage in this target date series was best of class. So, and this is this is a actively managed um, target date fund. It comes in at, at almost three times the cost as the prior one we were we were using. And there is value, there is alpha, there is return for that, there is consistency. So, as a fiduciary, what I find is the active managers allow me to keep a fund on a on a lineup longer. They're more, they're, I don't want to say they're more consistent because that's kind of loaded, but in terms of their fiduciary score, they, they, they hold longer. The passive is so, vol- is so inconsistent or volatile and tied to the volatility of the market that it really doesn't meet the needs of your qualified defaulted participants. So where I see uh, active management gaining a, a, a toehold in the future where it actually lost ground 
um, in the previous decade is going to be in that qualified default investment, be it a target date or, or some kind of manage, managed portfolio. Um, I, I'll also say that um, you got to manage your active managers. So uh, if, you're, if you're using passive funds, it's just that. You're, you're, you're taking your eye off the ball. You're, you're, you're not really doing your ongoing due diligence. If you're going to do uh, semi-annual meetings or quarterly meet with your your uh, your client, active managers are are how you win the day. Active managers are nimble. Uh, just just look at bond mutual funds over the past three to five years. That that's all the story I think you need to look at. No, that's great. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out to speak with us today, Evan. You're very welcome. Here's my favorite part of of the uh, podcast. I like to call it lightning round but officially we call it 60 seconds with evan Pulowski. let me know when you're ready ready to go profession if you weren't in finance social worker hidden talent yo yo best professional advice you've ever received be your authentic self golf what's your handicap i am a two right now would you rather play professional golf or professional hockey professional hockey have you ever had a hole in one no what never fails to make you laugh adam sandler what's one golf course you want to play at but have well augusta for everybody but the closest one yeah. i could get to would be shadow creek what's one piece of advice you would give your younger self do internships in college what's one question you think all clients should ask their financial advisor how do you get paid most rewarding part of your job when i come on site and people are complimentary of my advisors or that relationship manager that i have inside i love hearing that my people are being successful in building relationships favorite way to get active i would normally say golf but my daughter is a pitcher for softball so playing catch with her is up there right now Whether you're a seasoned advisor or just getting started, the Active Advisor brought to you by Harbor Capital offers professional insights for the financial advisor community. Visit us at harborcapital.com to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe to the Active Advisor on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date on investment trends, tried and tested research methods, and what your industry peers are up to. From all of us at Harbor Capital, thanks for tuning in. And now for important disclosures. This material is for informational purposes and is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast, research or investment advice and is not a recommendation, offer or solicitation to buy or sell any securities or adopt any investment strategy. The opinions expressed are as of 31st of May 2024 and are subject to change. The opinions expressed by the speakers do not necessarily represent the views of Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. The information and opinions contained in this material are derived from proprietary and non-proprietary sources deemed by Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. to be reliable and are not necessarily all-inclusive and are not guaranteed as to accuracy. This material may contain forward-looking information that is not purely historical in nature. Such information may include, among other things, projections and forecasts. There is no guarantee that any of these views will come to pass. This material may not be representative of the experience of other individuals. Reliance upon information in this material is at the sole discretion of the viewer. This material is not legal, tax or accounting advice please consult with a qualified professional for this type of advice. Investing involves risk, including the risk of loss. Specific companies and issuers are mentioned for educational purposes only and should not be deemed a recommendation to buy or sell any securities. Any companies mentioned do not necessarily represent current or future holdings of any investment products. Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. does and may seek to do business with companies covered in this podcast. As a result, listeners should be aware that the firm may have a conflict of interest that could affect the objectivity of this podcast. This material is prepared by Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. is not affiliated with Michigan 401k Advisors. All trademarks or product names mentioned herein are the property of their respective owners. Copyright 2024, Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. All rights reserved.